in my hand here a, uh, a puzzle so you can understand the piece by piece. And so uh, this morning, each one of you are going to get a piece of this puzzle. I hope there's enough pieces. So there's uh, these four little bags here. So pass them out, everybody. After the service, if you're inclined, you can do the puzzle together as a congregation, but that's not required. I just want you to realize that at this point, it takes many pieces to put together this silly little puzzle here. Well, one all right. piece is all we need. Well, one piece is all you need. Okay. But don't lose it. Because if you lose it, the puzzle won't fit together, right? Okay. Don't try and figure out what it is, all right? Because you won't. And it's not a, it's nothing big deal, you know. This puzzle came from the dollar store, so don't, you know. We're not deep into this thing. All right, I'm going to ask Mark, you can keep that as a souvenir. Um, I don't know when it started in my life, but it started, I think, when I was young. Um, I enjoyed putting together puzzles. You did that? Um, you know, started with those little ten-figure ones, you know, that had the little thing on it that you pick up. And especially if you go through this again with kids, you start with the puzzles. And this is sort of a good feeling when they all, it all comes together. And then uh, with our daughter, you know, I, I tried to get her the feelings that I had about puzzles. We do these ones with Mickey Mouse, 25, and then we got, went up to 50, and, and once in a while got up to 100 pieces. And um, But there's something about taking all these different pieces and then bringing them together to come together and do something. Now, my problem with puzzles is that I'm the only one in our family that really can understand this and, and appreciate it. Um, I was going to try and do a puzzle a couple weeks ago, and um, my wife said, you're not, you're not bringing that puzzle to the dining room table, are you? <laughs> I don't want that puzzle messed up for a week. There's things to do in this yard. I don't want you uh, playing with this puzzle when there's things to be fertilized and grass to be cut and all this kind of stuff. So I, I run into this opposition because I don't have the understanding at home, the importance of puzzles. <laughs> now I'm having a birthday this week and I'm getting older. And it's very important for your cognitive being to fight off dementia in your senior years to keep your mind active and to keep you know, your brain thinking and moving. And so a puzzle, as I explained to my wife, this is the most important thing <laughs> that, that you could probably do for yourself. Um, fortunately, two years ago, not fortunately, but remember Hurricane Irma? Was that two years ago? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fortunately, all the lights went off, all the power was off. Our kids came to live with us for a week. And there was nothing to do except I brought out this thousand-piece puzzle. <laughs> and it was fun. We all had fun putting all these little pieces together and spending time and everything like that. And, uh, but I haven't experienced that until just recently. At Christmas, my granddaughter, who's going to be tw uh, 12 in another week, um, bought me a puzzle for Christmas because what do you buy somebody who has everything, right? And uh, <laughs> so I got this puzzle. It's only a 500 pieces, so it didn't look that, that bad. And um, it's a picture of all kinds of ice cream in dishes and in bowls. And it's, you know, there's green pistachio, and there's mint chip, and there's, and there's strawberry, and there's vanilla, and there's chocolate sauce, and there's cherries. And on the top of the puzzle, there's this kind of bunting, for, sort of like the 4th of July. And it's not a big tablecloth, but it, the tablecloth's not white. Um, somebody had the great idea to make it like Joseph's color, color, his coat of many colors. So the tablecloth has all these stripes and colors, and then instead of just laying the tablecloth, it has all these wrinkles and folds in it. So anyway, uh, I thought our granddaughter was going to be with us three days uh, a couple weeks ago because her mom and dad had to go to school early to get things ready for the classroom, so we had her. So I said to Kelby the first day she was there, I got a great idea. Let's do the puzzle you gave Grandpa at Christmas. So 
with some opposition, but we had the granddaughter here on my side. Um, <laughs> we cleared off the dining room table and uh, opened up the puzzle and poured out all the pieces. And she watched me put all the pieces out. And she looked at the picture of the puzzle. And then she looked at me and said, Grandpa, I'm going to go watch cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it, and I have a picture on my iPhone to prove it. But it took a week, but it was a happy week for me. I enjoyed every, every part of it. One of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump. Remember that? Yeah. Because it kind of tells about my lifetime, my era growing up. And it's interesting, I also like with Forrest Gump, uh, because he had some disabilities, Actually, he was the most normal person in the whole movie. He's the one that brought everybody together. But remember, he was sitting at the bus stop there near the end. He has this box of candy that he's going to bring to um, his wife or girlfriend, whatever that was. And uh, he says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Well, there's some truth to that, but by, life is also like a puzzle. It's filled with many pieces many kinds of pieces to our lives. There's the learning type, there's the growing up, there's our family, there's our job, there's the car we drive, there's the things we worry about, all these different kinds of pieces that we have. And we are trying, in a sense, to kind of put them together and help them uh, make sense and, and to put it in some kind of order. So there's a, there's a picture and there's a feeling of accomplishment or there's a, a joy when it's done. Um, when I retired as the district superintendent of the Southeast Conference, I worked part-time for the Covenant Trust Company, you know that, and uh, so I can help people with some of their planning. Anyway, I worked uh, down at the uh, Covenant Village. We, it's a retirement home that the Covenant Church owns down in Plantation, which is near Fort Lauderdale. There's like 450 residents. It has regular residential living, assisted living, and nursing home. And um, so I'd go down there every other week and I'd stay a few days and, and work with folks mostly there. But I tell you what, what I really liked about the job was I would stay in one of the guest rooms at night and kind of walk around. And um, some of the residents tried to get me in the wee bowling league, you know, that they had and wasn't interested in that. But everywhere in every lounge, there were puzzles. Residents had these card tables and they had them all, puzzles all laid out, and they had like little paper plates with the puzzles in different colors, and it's just plate, and, and some, another color, and another plate. And then some of them have these white boards that they put next to it, and they were, they were everywhere, scattered. It was sort of like a mecca for puzzles. I was really pleased. I thought this was fun. I was thinking of signing up. I mean, just think, you could do these puzzles all the time. But I learned something about it. You have to be very careful. These are not public puzzles. Uh, one day I saw a couple pieces that went together. As I was looking at the one, I started putting together and I got in trouble. That person <laughs> saw me and said, that's my puzzle, you know? <laughs> I mean, they're putting it together, they're putting the pieces, it's not you to do, you know? You're not, this wasn't a shared venture. So I realized that I could just go and look unless I started my own, but I wasn't gonna be there that long unless I moved into the village. All right, all this is a parallel to our text this morning, what I'm going to bring us to into the book of Isaiah. As I said this morning, um, Isaiah was one of the older, famous prophets from the Old Testament. He was married, he had two sons, and he lived mostly his life in the city of Jerusalem. But he lived in a time when Israel had gone through a civil war, and um, they never had a Abraham Lincoln to get together. <laughs> There was the northern kingdom, and then there was Judah, which was basically the southern kingdom. And Judah was the one that stayed, at the time, closer to God. The northern kingdom kind of went off on its own way, more of a pagan way. But the Assyrians, who are really bad people that lived up where Persia is today, or uh, Iraq and Iran and all those areas, um, descendants from them, came down and took over the northern kingdom and took over a lot of the cities of Judah, the southern kingdom. So Israel, Judah, the time of Isaiah, 
was just sort of like the city of Jerusalem and some towns around it. I mean, it had gotten pretty small. And the sad thing about it was God originally gave the Israelites a complete puzzle. Gave them the whole box. Took them out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. Promised them a, a, a promised land that they could live and nurture and grow their families. A big area of Dan to Beersheba and all the way down even to the Red Sea that they could be in and be part of. So they had a puzzle that they could put together. God gave them all the pieces to come into the promised land, to take the land they were allotted, to conquer those peoples, to build their homes, and to worship God. But little by little, they kept putting the pieces back in the box <laughs> instead of putting it together. And now at this particular time, they've gotten pretty small just because they've disobeyed God. It says, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks, the sons that I have reared and brought up, but have revolted against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows its master, and the manger, but Israel does not, my people does not understand. Alas, a sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, they've abandoned the Lord. Basically, Israel was never going to be able to put this puzzle together because they let the pieces go and they wouldn't let God take his frightful act of helping them and put the journey. And so God appeals to them one more time through the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah, if you remember, at Christmas time when we read a lot of things, prophesied the coming of Christ and uh, how that was going to happen, and, uh, and how a virgin was going to bear a child. All this comes from Isaiah. Wonderful, great person. Anyway, in verse 18, God is saying to the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Come, think about what I have done for you, the life that I've offered you, the freedom, the deliverance, through Egypt, the land that I've given you, the opportunities, and how I've saved you so many times. Come reason together. Think about this, what I have for you, and be part of, uh, part of our kingdom together. Let's put this thing together. Let's put the pieces together and make the journey work. When I was 20 years old, my father passed away at the age of 53. And... Um, my mother remarried two years later a man by the name of David Nyron. Um, he was 66 years old and never been married. And he said he never found the right girl or woman or older lady at this time. Anyway, um, just before he had gotten married, um, he finally gave up of ever getting married and he had bought a, had a deal years ago, a, a diamond ring that he was going to give to his bride, whoever that was going to be. And he figured by this time of his life he never was, so he sold it. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he met my mom. So anyway, David was a wonderful Christian man. And I remember one day he and I were talking, and he, he wanted to tell me the time that, uh, how he became a Christian. And he said, there's a verse in Isaiah that just spoke to me, just reached out to me, and that was the moment that I came to God. And it's this verse. Verse 18, where God speaks to the Israelites. Come now, let us reason together. Where God is actually saying, even to us, think now what I've done for you in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've made the possibility of, of your sins to be forgiven. I could bring you into eternal life. And even though Satan is still rampant and evil is still here, and there's a lot of things in the world that we don't like, God has promised that he will end all that. But right now he's promised us to give us strength. So in a sense, all of our life are different pieces of a puzzle. But when we put God in that mix, the puzzle will come together and make sense. There are five ways to approach a puzzle. You know I'm not a long when it preaches, so these will, these, will be, these will be short. But as we look at life and as we look at things, there's five ways to kind of, and neat, none of them are wrong. 
But we kind of take these different approaches in order to make it. The, the one approach is the, the strategist, and that's me. Uh, the first thing I do with that 500 puzzle that my granddaughter went in the other room and watched cartoons with, um, I look for all the end pieces, and I do the outline. I mean, that's, that's where I start. Once you get that, you kind of feel like, hey, you're on this road. It's going to come together. You can start putting the little pieces together. So I strategize. You know, I got to get all these pieces, and I lay them all out, and anything with an end. And there's some pieces that really don't look like an end, you know? And they just have a little, and they, they'll trick you. And then another thing that happens, we, uh, below the dining room table, which is now nice and cleaned up, um, we have this multicolored rug. <laughs> and when you're doing a puzzle and your sleeves bump it a little bit, sometimes you're looking all over for a piece to fit in there and it's down there on the floor, you know, and you gotta, you gotta go down to get it. Anyway, that's the first way to approach it. The second is to be a hunter. The hunter is you take all the green pistachio ice cream deal and put all the green together, but then you try and keep it separated from the mint chip, <laughs> which looks the same. You gotta look at it. And then there's uh, the ice cream that has the um, cherries on top, the little sundaes. And so you gotta kinda keep that separate and you put that in a pile. And then you start this terrible blanket that's down below it and you take these little strips of bread and the blue and the yellow. And you put all these in piles, and so that's the hunter. You hunt for these different little things, little keys. And then you start putting those little things together, and then you put another one together, and then once in a while, they'll come together. <laughs> they'll actually come together. Then the third way to approach a puzzle is the competitor. I mean, you're gonna get this thing done. And you're gonna be up all night, you're gonna get it done, you're gonna, you know, you're just gonna compete, you're gonna, beat anybody else, and there might be people helping you, other family people, but you kind of grab the pieces, you know, and you're, you're just kind of like, like in the uh, kind of village there. You can, it's your puzzle and you're gonna get it done yourself. Then there's the leisurely approach. You know, the puzzle can sit out for a month and uh, people can just kind of come by as you come by the dining room, even though you haven't had company in a month. Um, I remember when Cindy's mom was staying with us years ago and she didn't have sympathy for puzzles either, but I'd see her in there. I saw her in their bathrobe and she was trying to put a piece together. You know, I mean, leisurely, the puzzle just kind of comes together. People kind of pass through and do it. And then the fifth way to approach a puzzle is the achiever. You're going to achieve this thing and conquer it and, and get it done. The same goal is the same for all of us, wholeness, to complete it. You know, there's a joy when a puzzle's put together. I mean, I have the pictures of the last one I did, and I, you know, I'm not going to erase it for a while, because I mean, and I showed it to my granddaughter, I said, this is what you missed. You know? <laughs> I mean, there really is a good feeling. And we come together with God in our lives and take all the different pieces together. There's a good feeling when we can ask God the meaning of it, when we could put together Say, how does this fit in my life? How does this particular fit? I don't understand what's going on here, but I see you see the big picture, how the, the puzzle looks like on the, on the box and how it should be, and I need your help to put it together. And so really the message today is, Jesus says to us, come, let us reason together. Remember how much I love you, how I created you. I know everything about you. Uh, when your body was unformed in your mother's womb, I knew each day that was going to be about your life. And how I know the pieces of your life, how we're going to be. And um, let me put them together for you. Don't go off on your own. Don't follow the, the wheels of the wiles of the devil and, and sin in this world that are so tempting. But realize the real meaning and the real wholeness of anything that comes together is through God and through Jesus Christ. And he invites us to come and to reason together. Years ago, uh, when I was in college, um, there was a guy that would pick us up for Sunday school uh, to one of the covenant churches. And the man's name who, who picked us up was Warner Salmon. And if you remember that name at all, he wrote and painted the most famous picture of Christ, the head of Christ, Salmon's head of Christ. Anybody see that? You've seen it everywhere. 
he had a dream one night, and he got up and, and he did this painting. And um, so he was the, the driver of the car that would pick us up and take us to his church. And I know he was a person of God because he talked and looked at us half the time while he was driving. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't crash. Anyway, he did a painting of Jesus standing at, at a door. And it's another famous painting. And the doorknob, uh, there isn't one. It has to be opened from the inside. And it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, just waiting for you to open up, meaning, come, let us reason together. I want to be a part of your life. I want to be a part of the puzzles and all the aspects that you have that you're trying to put together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your word. We thank you for the prophet Isaiah who lived so long ago for his message and the difficulty of proclaiming it and in this world we pray that we'll continue to pray and proclaim the message that you've given to us that you love mankind that you care about them you hurt when we've gone away you've hurt when we've taken the puzzles that, of life that you've given to us and refused to put them together or just take them back and put them back in the box and don't look at them Lord help us to be people that come to you and to understand that you are the meaning, the totality, and the purpose of our own lives. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us. In your name we pray. Amen.